So as we consider, uh, consider what it means to follow Christ, uh, we have to be mindful that discipleship was never meant to be just a private individualistic affair. We need to walk with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And so the second part of this morning's session will focus on the theme of working and growing together. Now, our next speaker is superbly qualified to address just that. Catherine Leary Alsdorf is widely known for her pioneering work in founding the Redeemer Center of Faith, sorry, the Redeemer Center for Faith and Work, and also for her work with Tim Keller in, with, in writing the landmark book, Every Good Endeavor. Let's give it up for Catherine Alsdorf. Hello, it's God's sense of humor that I've been asked to speak about the importance of working and growing together. In my late 30s, I was a reluctant seeker and happy to be lost in the crowd at Redeemer and quick to be the first out the door so that nobody would talk to me. If there was a God, I wanted to wrestle with him alone. Of course, God did use other people to draw me over to the line of surrender, but if left to my own preferences, I would have steered clear of anything remotely resembling a community group or connecting. I was not interested in growing together. However, fast forward a decade or so, and God invited me to join, to create a faith and work ministry designed to equip, connect, and mobilize the Redeemer congregation. I traveled here because of relationships built over the last several decades. I read Bill Hendricks, Your Work Matters to, God, Matters to God, before I was a believer, and then I got to work for a decade or more with him on the Theology of Work project. In around 2014, I was on the team that Eric Welsh pulled together that was the precursor to the NFW, NFWA. Yes, um, I spoke at the first Faith and Work Summit in Boston that um, David Gill pulled together and subsequent ones that um, Bill Peel did and I think a few more after that. Um, I've been spurred on by the work of Wendy Simpson and her entrepreneurial fervor. Um, there are so many of you that I've been privileged to get to know over the years. So we have definitely worked and grown together. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation to speak, and more importantly, to set the stage for you to hear about the remarkable work of the panelists that come after me. So we've all traveled here to connect, to cultivate relationships, to collaborate. Yesterday, I read a piece by Mike Metzger of the Clapham Institute, in which he shared the origins of the word travel. It meant a journey fraught with danger. <laughs> He said, in the olden days, travel was really dangerous because of robbers, all kinds of things. You could lose your life. Christians traveled on pilgrimages, and they were journeys fraught with danger. And they were seeking on those pilgrimages to encounter God. Their aim along the way, in the midst of all that danger, was to deepen their desire for things of heaven. For most of us, our travel has not been anywhere close to fraught with that kind of danger, but I do pray that our time together in Dallas is to, seek, is to encounter God and deepen our desire for the things of heaven. Yes, we're friends, old and new, but I pray we also encounter God anew. I pray we'll grow in our understanding of all that we have in the gospel of Jesus. The scripture I want to draw our attention to this morning is Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promises is faithful. And let us, not, and let us consider how we may spur one another along to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing nearer, the word of the Lord. There were, these were the theme verses of the Center for Faith and Works 2009 Entrepreneurs Forum. It was a, the fourth annual conference we'd had to inspire and launch gospel-centered ventures in New York City um, that would serve the city in the area of the arts, non-for-profit, and for-profit. 
This forum was a real witness to the power of pulling people together. Diverse vocations, first-time entrepreneurs, and experienced people who could both coach and fund those ventures. We were there to spur one another on toward love and good works. But the basis of that spurring is in the first verse, which I think is important to us this week. The first thing to notice is that what we profess is hope. We stir each other up in light of this hope we profess. As human beings, we are unavoidably hope-based creatures. What we believe about the future deeply shapes and controls how we live today. Most of the time, if a person believes at the end of a hard, grueling day's work, they're going to be criticized and belittled. That will affect how they work. It'll be different than if they worked throughout that hard and grueling day knowing they were going to get a $25,000 bonus. It changes how we live in the present. In the same way, what we believe about the future of the world changes how we live and work today. If you believe that the way to a secure future is to work as hard as you can, climb the ladder higher than anyone else, put away enough money to re retire in leisure, that belief has a huge impact on how you work. Any disruption of that plan, well, it leads to huge angst and inner turmoil. But if you believe that your future is already secure, that Jesus reconciled the breach between humanity and God, and you'll be re resurrected into a new heavens and new earth where every tear will be wiped away, I think you'd handle that disruption differently. Your hope for the future shapes how you live in the present. However, it's clear from these verses in Romans 10 that we all swerve from this hope. Even when we profess that the Bible's good news is our future, we don't always live it out. Our functional theology doesn't always connect to our professed theology. This has become uncomfortably clear to me a number of times, but most notably during the season when I was switching from being a high-tech CEO to taking a job at Redeemer. While a CEO, I told myself that the job and the money and the reputation really wasn't that important to me. I was there because God had called me to that role. But when I received Redeemer's offer, um, I mean, you know, a church lady, no title, 20% of the pay. Well, I almost turned it down. And then I realized I'd put a whole lot more hope and faith in corporate success and the, remuner that, that, the money to secure for myself the right kind of future than I did in my professed hope, my, my future secured by Christ. When eventually accepting the Redeemer job, I literally had to remind myself over and over and over that my home in heaven would be way more beautiful than the cute little cottage in Menlo Park, California that I was giving up. I needed to shore up my hope in a future secured by Christ. If Jesus was really raised from the dead, and he was, and if our resurrection is really coming, and it is, then we always have a hope. Our problems here go from being capital P problems to little p problems. They don't go away, but they become little p problems. If we don't ground ourselves in that hope, then we, when we swerve from it, which we will, we become controlled by the things in this world. If we don't believe in the banquet awaiting us in heaven, we cling to the riches that you can hold on to in the here and now. So for our people, for ourselves, in order to go into the world where the God of profit or the God of self-expression or the God of survival of the fittest is really holding sway, um, and if we're to go into that and not be swayed by those things, we need to remind ourselves and each other that the gospel is real over and over and over. 
So back to that grounding scripture. This hope that we profess in a faithful God undergirds any ability we have to spur one another on toward love and good works. We need each other to live out this hope. We need each other to forsake, to go through the hardship, to to give up some of the things of this world that the people around us are enjoying. The verse continues with almost a reprimand. Don't neglect to meet together. In order to live in light of the true hope of the gospel, in order to turn our profession of hope into a lived hope, we need each other. Those who are touched by our ministry back home, they need us to model living into that hope as we disciple and equip them um, as, we, as they are, we are the people that are apprenticing them um, into that hope themselves. So like us this week, we encourage them to meet together because it's all too easy to swerve. I hope you realize that this change, this switch from trusting in the things of this world, the things this world tells us to put our trust in, to a faith in the gospel, that's a huge, huge job. That's a huge change to lead people through. As leaders, we're in the business of leading change. We're always looking at the from and the to. The from where people are now to where they can be by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Romans 12, move from being conformed to the pattern of this world to being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Galatians 5, move from works of the flesh, jealousy, envy, divisions. Move to the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace. Ephesians, move from the old self, corrupt through deceitful desires, to a new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. We hope our people will move from thinking their work in the road crew or in the office is less important than that of a pastor or a missionary, to realizing their work matters to God. So to all you leaders of change, change is hard. Any change is hard. It's hard to get a congregation to switch their worship style, their worship music, let alone this kind of change. It's hard to move from the ways of the world toward a hope that we profess. Throughout scripture, there's always this turn from loving self above all else to loving God and its creation first, the first and second commandments. So I really think the church, those of us in these ministries, are in the business of the hardest change ever, changing from living for ourselves to living for God. Last September, I was in Carthage, the ancient city that held the Council of Carthage way back when in the country that's now Tunisia. We went to ruins, some of them, one, a beautiful baptistry that was built with steps going down this dark passageway leading to the baptistry at the bottom. And that was symbolic of the old self and dying to that. And then at the bottom was this beautiful baptistry. And once you were baptized, the steps leading up on the other side were filled with light, filled with hope, representing the new self. But we learned that these newly baptized converts, in order to be fully catechized, now I can't say the word, catechized, that's it, uh, from their pagan beliefs to this new belief in the truth of the gospel, spent two full years in sort of cloistered monasteries to be discipled in the, in the change, in the change from beliefs in the pagan ways to faith in the good news of Jesus. It was that big a change, it's that big a change now, and it requires intensive discipleship. Our world's changed dramatically, but that's still our leadership calling to disciple toward the Christ one future hope, even as our people navigate the brokenness of their workplaces in a world that doesn't share that viewpoint. We can't do it alone, and our people can't do it alone. 
In a few minutes, I'll have a panel of impressive leaders who'll share some of the ways that they're connecting Christians to spur each other on to love and good works. But in my few minutes left, I'd like to share a few of the lessons I've learned, lessons about the need for what we're doing, a few lessons about programs and some of the fruit. The need. When I got to Redeemer in this role, there was huge pent-up demand. People wanted help. They didn't know some, any other Christian in their company or even in their whole vocation. They were eager to gather to talk and pray. But I did find that what they wanted um, often was very different from one person to the next. A teacher stressed by inner city kids just wanted prayer to keep going. But another teacher had this vision for how his school could be really renewing the whole city and wanted to talk about that. And another was wrestling with whether he even wanted to be a teacher. He wanted to talk about calling all the time. Each vocation group had their own, each leader had their own set of desires for that particular group. And that's where David Miller's four E's that he talked about last night came in handy. He talked about how in looking at the um, faith and work world over the last 50 years, these various ministries tended to focus on one of the four E's, evangelism, or he called it expression last night, ethics, determining the right thing to do and doing it, experience, finding meaning and purpose in your work, or enrichment, employing the resources of our faith to really um, persevere and sustain us. David's book, that's specifically chapter 7, um, encouraged us and encouraged our leaders to really, th the need to address all four of these areas and even go deeper in them. So as I worked with the volunteer leaders of the law group, the education group, the healthcare group, the architects group, we had about 18 different groups. Um, he provided a really helpful framework to help people enlarge their vision beyond their own individual needs. And it was also the case that none of their deeper needs would be met without a deeper theological grounding. And I don't have time to go into all of that here, but that is what we tried to capture after 10 years, um, the theology that made a difference in people's work lives. In, that's what we try to do in every good endeavor. And um, I procrastinated for 12 years, but we're finally working on a workbook to accompany that. <laughs> good theology enriched all of our group conversations and helped them move from a professed faith to a lived faith. I could talk a lot about programs because I, in addition to Redeemer, I helped start a faith and work ministry in Raleigh and I've coached lots of other churches, but let me just highlight a few things. Don't start with a program. Focus on the change, the from and the to that you want to see happen in people's work lives and then just experiment, just try things and if it doesn't work, if it's not affecting the change, the heart change, the, the gospel transformation you want to see, kill it and try something new. Secondly, don't do it yourself. You can lead or train, but make it a train the trainer, a lead the leader kind of program. Because we all know that the ones who learn the most are the ones that teach or the ones that lead. Um, so let them do it, um, as well as it helps your scale. It helps you be able to expand your program. Get as many people involved in owning the ministry themselves as possible. At one point, we had 18 vocation groups and three to six leaders for each one. We coached them, but they ran the groups. Thirdly, beware of the tendency toward rules. I've gotten so many questions. Should I work on Sunday? Should I advertise a cigarette project? Should I keep a Bible on my desk? It's almost like people wanted a checklist. Just tell me what to do, I'll check them. And I'll be like, no, the gospel isn't about a checklist. The gospel isn't about rules. The gospel's about a relationship with God. We really need to disciple you into the wisdom that comes from a deeper relationship with God. Lastly, beware of Christian self-righteousness, particularly in this age. Don't let people believe that the dividing line between good and evil is between those who are Christians and those who aren't. Don't perpetuate the myth that Christians are the good people and everyone else is bad. 
The doctrine of grace was particularly meaningful in our context in New York. Believers who'd been struggling to understand why some of their colleagues who didn't believe at all were better people and did more good works than some of the Christians they knew. My favorite definition of common grace is from Tim Keller. That's description, really. Believers are never as good as our right worldview should make us, and unbelievers are never as messed up as their false worldview should make them. The line between good and evil runs down the middle of every human's heart. The fruit that encourages me most is heart change, seeing selfish desires turn into self-giving desires, seeing animosity between colleagues change to respect and care, seeing career disappointments being met with hope and trust, seeing insecurity-based self-promotion turn into humble confidence in God's sovereignty. Our mantra at the Center for Faith and Work has been, the gospel changes everything. It changes our hearts, it changes our relationships, and it changes our work. God is at work, he invites us to join him, and I rejoice at the fruit that comes when our hope professed becomes the hope lived out, and it results in love and good works. So now it's time to hear from our esteemed panelists, and as they're coming out, let me um, give you a little bit about them. We have Jim Brangenberg of the ministry I Work For Him, and we have Mike Repovich, who leads the Global Christian Employee Network at Intuit. We have Autumn Hanlein, Director of Strategic Partners and City Networks at Faith Driven Entrepreneurs. And we have Chuck Proudfit of Cincinnati, who back in 2003 gathered a small group of Christ followers to talk about work as worship. So would you please welcome our panelists? I'm gonna stand. All right, let's, go, let's let them all introduce themselves in two minutes. I know that's really hard. Um, so, Jim, let's start with you, and then we're going to try to have a little dialogue. Um, but you could really listen to these guys for about an hour and a half. So let's see what we can do here. So, Jim. I am Jim Brangenberg with I Work For Him. We are a connecting ministry. Uh, we do that through podcasting, but we connect our listeners to the reality that their work matters to God. And then we connect those listeners to ministries like yours to take that discipleship to a whole new level. But ultimately, we spend most of our time connecting ministries to each other, which is where we spend a lot of our time on a daily and weekly basis. It seems that God has given us a mouthpiece uh, within the faith and work movement, and we try to use that to lift up what God is doing all over the place, and we try to gather people together to celebrate that, and we do that on multiple platforms like the Awaken Podcast Network, which is, has 168 podcasts speaking into the faith and work movement, and you can find that online at awakenpodcastnetwork.com. But also, we're doing this on the Tapestry Project. We're documenting as many as we could find that are out there, as many organizations we could find that are documenting or that are discipling workplace believers across the country. And we've identified 768 organizations at this point in time that we found that are doing that. And that tapestry is available to all of you to identify players that you can work with, work alongside. And there's so much more I'll say, but I'll use my time later, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go to Chuck. Good morning, everybody. I am a co-vocational guy. I lead a consulting firm called Insight Out, which works with clients around the world and is designed to take Christians in consulting and take those truths from the Lord and translate them into plain glass language. So we bring solutions to the clients. Most folks don't know that about me because the rest of the work that I do and that is so relevant for what we're about here is the at work on purpose ministry. This is in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it emerged by accident, I'll explain that later, and ended up becoming a citywide model for workplace ministry, and it now has about 12,000 people involved in a decentralized organic network that covers the city. Inside Out is at insightoutcorp.com, and at work on purpose is at workonpurpose.org. That's great. And Mike? 
Hello, everyone. Um, I'll try to practice um, what we were called to yesterday, what we uh, learned yesterday in terms of I'm in full-time ministry as a program manager at Intuit. <laughs> uh, what is Intuit? TurboTax, QuickBooks, MailChimp, Credit Karma, financial uh, services and software for your personal finances, taxes, and businesses. I also have the privilege to be the co-leader of the uh, ERG, Employee Resource Group, that is the Intuit Christian Network. Intuit, 17,000 employees altogether, 15 ERGs, three of them focused on faith, uh, and a Muslim network, a Christian network, and just this year, a new Jewish network. We have about 500 people uh, involved in that Christian network uh, today. And uh, what we try to do in that context of work at Intuit, and, and here in the theme of connections, is connect people together. One of the things that, that's one of the biggest benefits folks always describe, is just knowing who shares my faith here at work. Uh, is, is very clearly helpful to folks. What's also great is connection between leaders from other Christian ERGs. Eric Welch does an amazing job and has for years, uh, gathers us together monthly where we can share best practices. Uh, we can learn materials from each other. And there's the, uh, also the uh, uh, scrub sink uh, that happens there where some uh, ERGs are very, very mature in what they do. And so others who are less mature, I guess for us at Intuit, we're, just get, we're continuing to grow. And then other companies that aren't even sure it's legal or aren't even sure it's okay. And so there's plenty of learning that occurs there. And then connections between those companies, we have shared events. Uh, a praise event before Thanksgiving, National Day of Prayer, shared Easter events, uh, shared prayer uh, when cultural events happen and things of that nature. So that's a little picture of uh, Intuit. So. Thank you, Mike. And Autumn? Yeah, thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, I am with Faith Driven Entrepreneur and Faith Driven Investor. Uh, so Faith Driven Entrepreneur is a movement of one million entrepreneurs. Or if you ask our co-founder, Henry Kaysner, internally, he would say 100 million entrepreneurs, <laughs> uh, because that's how entrepreneurs think. Um, but one million entrepreneurs uh, to bring them together in community so that they can fulfill their call to create and transform the world around them. We do that through three things, through content, so uh, the Faith Driven Entrepreneur podcast, and also video content and a blog and website. And then um, well, what I think we're going to talk about more particularly here through community. So bringing entrepreneurs together in peer groups of anywhere from you know, 5 to 12 is usually our average number of folks that are in a group together uh, so that they can work through what we call the marks of a faith-driven entrepreneur. There's 12 marks. Uh, we start, start with called to create, um, and we move all the way through um, those 12 and, and work through those together. We've had globally about 17,000. Um, entrepreneurs go through that eight-week foundation group. About 4,000 of them have chosen to continue on at their chosen cadence, whether that's continue to be weekly, uh, every other week, or monthly. And then we've had about 480 or so of those groups meet within the church. I'll briefly mention that Faith Driven Investor is the other side of the movement, which is working with those who are either high net worth or in the financial um, space to believe that God owns it all and cares deeply about the why and where of our investment strategies. I don't think we're going to talk about that, but in case that appeals to you, happy to talk about that later. That's great. All right, let me do a first question to kick us off. Chuck and Mike, you in particular are focused on connecting and gathering people inside their actual places of work. So why is that important? What makes them come, and what makes them come back? We found with the At Work on Purpose ministry that community is one of the most important ingredients in building a, a really effective pathway for discipleship and spiritual engagement in the workplace. To be perfectly honest, we kind of stumbled on it by accident. It was, it was originally just my loneliness. As a guy who'd come to Christ in my 30s, my frustration with work had led me on a spiritual search that brought me to the Lord. I started going to church, and I was stunned that there wasn't faith-active working Christians in every organization. Instead, it seemed to be just the opposite. And my frame of reference was the New Testament, like in the book of Acts, where they did everything together. It was in community, but they were empowered and they were making a huge impact. And I was so starved for that. Out of that emerged a desire on my part to create a life group for work life. And I, 
wanted at first to do it through a local church. I couldn't find one that was interested in the idea, so I decided to do it myself. Pulled that group together, and it grew over the course of six months entirely through word of mouth from just a dozen people to over 300. And all of it was driven by the idea of community, just not feeling alone in the place of work. And when you have community, it creates a platform, a foundation for everything that follows from that. Problem solving together, discipleship vocationally, all kinds of creative ideas for spiritual engagement in and through the places where God has strategically deployed us to work. Thank you, great. Mike, you wanna comment? Yeah, I think I'd, it, kind of two ends of, of a continuum, I would say. Uh, we heard a little bit more this morning uh, about something similar. One of the mo most common question I get is, hey Mike, is it okay if we do fill in the blank here? Can I schedule a Zoom for a Bible study? Can I, can I take a coworker and go over in that room over there and pray? Is it okay that we do this here? And so we connect very regularly to make sure people know that it's okay. Once you get over that hurdle, then it's a matter of modeling those things and connecting. And so there's a, a weekly Bible fellowship that we do. There's a monthly fellowship session where someone volunteers to share a testimony. We recognize Easter, uh, Christmas, National Day of Prayer, those kinds of places where we're together. And so that, hopefully then addresses part of the other end of the spectrum. There's a great hunger for these kinds of things for people at work. By all means, that, that sacred secular divide is absolutely real for some, that they don't think they can do it. Others are convinced, but they're not sure how. Or others are convinced and they, they need help, or they want to just find other places to be able to do that at their workplace. So, um, and inside of that continuum is a number of things, including those that aren't believers. When uh, uh, racial tensions flare up, when there's uh, uh, violence, a shooting that occurs and things of that sort, we're always available to uh, have a prayer session or to just uh, uh, hold discussions with people in those areas. So even those outside the faith will look to uh, networks like these uh, for some consultation, because deep down we all know that they have that same kind of hunger, they, they just don't know it yet. So. How much is organic and how much is sort of top down in both of yours? That's a great question. Um, we do proactively have, you know, weekly Bible fell up Monday night, so that everyone can just expect that, you know, that Friday at 9 a.m., you know, is when we're together, those kinds of things. Uh, what happens very uh, ad hoc is inside of our Slack channel, right? There's a Christian Network Slack channel, and so that's open to all to share. So it's amazing, the worship music that gets shared, or the, or the question, the prayer requests that come, and that leads to deeper conversations and, and any number of different things. Um, so it's a little bit of both. Okay, that's great, yeah. In our case, it started much more organic, and it became more programmatic. Right. It's amazing when working Christians start to meet each other in the places where we work, at first it's just this sense of excitement that you have a community of peers. And then eventually that network grows and what starts to happen is that across the network, people become aware of all kinds of workplace ministry initiatives, discipleship programs, prayer groups, and then the network starts to communicate that all of that's available, where it is, when it is, and it becomes programmatic, but always with the flavor of a network that's very flexible, very adaptive. Thanks. So Autumn, entrepreneurs, if, if everyone else is lonely in the workplace as a Christian, entrepreneurs are lonely because there's not too many people in their workplace. So. You couldn't really pull together large concentrations within one company, and you chose, to some extent, to go to churches. Um, can you talk about that and how that's worked? Sure. Yeah, I think lonely is the number one word that I hear from entrepreneurs when I talk to them. I can almost just set a timer, and by the time we're three minutes into the conversation, that word is going to come up. Uh, and usually what, how they express that is that they're lonely because the marketplace where they're trying to build their business does not fully understand some of the theological principles that they're trying to live by, of rest or, or different things um, that, that might be different because they're believers. And so they don't find you know, community there. And then they say, as we've heard several times here, you know, my church doesn't fully understand me either because I am called to build this business as my ministry in the place that I glorify God. Um, so when addressing that loneliness, I wanna say we, we started our community groups in 2020. So they started out all online and we still have a huge presence online, but the center of the bullseye for us 
is the church. Um, and we believe that's because that's where entrepreneurs are already or that they know they should be. Like, you know, if we're believers, we kind of know, like, we should be in church, we should be involved there. Uh, and so it becomes a place where instead of an additive, they are finding value where they are already. And I will say, you know, as we've talked about the church, I just... Um, I think there's a lot of hurt that comes from not being seen, and then we want people to see us. And so I think the cool thing about having a faith-driven entrepreneur group within the church is it fits in the small group model, and they can start it. And, and any pastor, if someone comes and says, hey, I want to start a group to disciple entrepreneurs, I've got the materials, I want to lead it, it's a pretty easy yes, and then that sometimes gets the attention of the church leadership as well, which is a, a great little cycle there. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jim, you've been the storyteller of this movement for 18 years or more. Um, how have you seen, um, I, I'd sort of like you to talk about the depth. Have we grown in depth of change as you've seen people work, whether it's in their company meeting or in a church meeting? Well, I don't want to take more credit than I should. It's been 11 years. Not, oh, sorry, I, sorry, sorry. I don't want to take any credit, but, and, and it's been Martha and I. But over the last 11 years, we've interviewed over 4,000 people on over almost 2,800 different podcasts, capturing what God is doing in, the, in this country, in the workplaces. And we've covered every kind of workplace, covering every kind of mountain or cultural influence, whatever you want to call it. But what we see is that, you know, the movement started off with, an, uh, with a, I'm going to work for God. And... I want to know that my work matters to God. And that was my own story. It's like I wanted to know that my work mattered to God, but nobody would tell me. I didn't hear it from the pulpit. And what we started to see is that the Holy Spirit started popping up people all over the country with this reality that, wow, my work really matters. Now what do I do with that? And so thousands of ministries have popped up over the country. We've only documented 768, but I'll tell you, based on what we know and the people we talk to, I think there's two to three to 4,000 individual ministries of people discipling others. So the depth, Catherine, has moved from I work for him, and it's moving towards I work with him. Hmm. And that's where we're moving as a movement, because God doesn't need us to work for him. He wants us to work with him. Right. And as we've talked with people, I think that really relies on us as faith and work-focused organizations to understand that we're not alone. That there are, like I said, there are hundreds, if not thousands. And, we, and we're all heading in the same direction, Catherine. We're all on the same highway. Just picture, you know, I-75 through Atlanta. We're all t 20 lanes wide, but we're all heading in the same direction. And some of us are in different lanes, doing different things within the faith and work movement. But a lot of us are in the same lane. And in fact, some of us are in the exact same cars. But we don't even know each other. And that's the purpose of the tapestry movement. We need to introduce people that are doing exactly the same thing and start to accomplish economies of scale. But even further, to take that, we're in the same car, as a movement, we need to start celebrating, the, just picture the choir. We all are singing the same message. And when we sing in unison, it's incredible. But when we start to celebrate the harmony that God has given us, and we start to sing in harmony, that's where great choral concerts are have. And when you start to sing and celebrate the harmony that we all have, that's when we'll start to see the move, the movement of the faith and work movement go to a different direction, a different level. And Catherine, I frankly, I think it's based on what Martha and I have seen, and we've seen so much happen and cover it from... We haven't gone to Alaska, we haven't gone to Hawaii, although we should have probably, but we've covered people from every other state, is that God is continuing to lift up people all the time, but I think it's time to grab the National Faith and Work Association and lift it up as a movement, as a place that can unify us, that can celebrate the harmony that we all have, but also to curate the collaborations that are happening across the country as a place that we can come together and steward it well. Thank you. I want to. We don't have too much more time. So, Autumn, down to um, Chuck, to Mike. Can you do a little bit of fruit that you've seen, and we'll end on how is God blessed through this? Sure. Um, I think for us, we've seen a lot of uh, business-related fruit where people have gone into business together. They've uh, accelerated um, what they're working on. But my favorite story, uh, we 
try to call every participant in a group. And I called a gentleman, this has probably been about two years ago, it was one of our earlier groups, um, and he was in Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm from North Carolina myself, so it makes me happy that he was there. Uh, but I called him and he picked up and he said, you know, you told me that I was, I was called to create, that that was, that was a calling, that me building this business was a calling. You told me that I wasn't the owner of the thing that I own. And then he's like, and I've started to realize that scripture spoke to me as a business owner uniquely and he's like, I've started going with my wife back to church and opening my Bible and looking at it because I now realize that it speaks directly to me as an entrepreneur. And so that is our goal with Faith Driven is that there's the heart transformation, which then leads to the you know, business transformation, community transformation, and uh, we like to say entrepreneurs shape culture, so cultural transformation as well. One of the projects that's emerged for us recently is working with the Lilly Foundation and Harvard University to develop a dashboard to measure quality of life on the scale of a city. And we're going to be prototyping that in the state of Ohio so that we can spread that to cities everywhere. The third level of fruit has been taking the idea of a city-wide community of working Christians and being able to propagate that meme across cities. We're starting to see the formation of a network, and every city has a different landscape, different brand names, different leaders, but what we have in common is the idea that we're after two things together, both vocational flourishing and cultural flourishing. So on the one hand, find and fulfill our highest and best individual use at work, and on the other hand, also seek the peace and prosperity of the cities where we work and where we live.